You know, I was raised in a uh, Pentecostal household uh, as a daughter of Pentecostal pastors, so 25 minutes for me is like the intro to the message, um, but I'll keep it short for today, so don't worry. Have you ever had that scary moment when you don't notice something, or worse, someone in your blind spot? Maybe it's uh, another car, hopefully not a human being, uh, but it's that moment when you're trying to merge, um, you check your mirrors, you put your blinker on, but the car to your right or to your left simply was just in that little spot that you couldn't see. And one of the first things they teach you, right, when you're learning to drive is to watch out for that blind spot. Those areas that are so close to us that our rear view mirrors can't pick them up. So today I want to talk to you all about uh, the blind spots that each of us carry. It's that metaphorical spot or that angle that we can't see, but others can. So in Acts chapter 9, uh, the lecture that was just read, we read about a man named Saul, a man who was zealous, who was educated. Uh, he was a Jew who had a vendetta against all Christians, um, all disciples of Jesus Christ, and Scripture speaks of Paul as a murderous assassin, one who was literally breathing out murderous threats against the disciples of the Lord, as Acts 9.1 states. So in this chapter, Saul's on his way to Damascus. He has letters of authorization in hand to arrest and kill followers of the way, which is an early name for Christians. And as he's on his way, a light flashes around him and he hears a booming voice say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul asks, who are you, Lord? And the voice says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. After this, and this is what I wanna focus on today, Saul goes blind for three days. He doesn't eat or drink anything. And later in the chapter, we hear about a disciple named Ananias. The Lord calls Ananias, you know, Ananias is minding his own business, and the Lord tells Ananias, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street, very specific, they didn't want him to get lost, uh, and ask for a man of, from Tarsus named Saul, he should be praying. And the Lord tells Ananias that a vision has been given to Paul, or to Saul, that uh, someone named, you guessed it, Ananias, will go and pray for him to restore his sight. Now imagine you're Ananias. You're a Christian, you're minding your business, you've heard the reports and the stories of this legend, this assassin named Paul, I'm sorry, Saul, who is persecuting and murdering your brothers and sisters. And on top of that, he's on his way to your hometown. The last thing you wanna hear from God is, I want you to go and pray for that specific guy. But long story short, Ananias goes, places his hands on Saul, and utters these two powerful words. He calls him Brother Saul. With that, Saul regains his sight, he was baptized, he ate something, that's always important, and he regained his strength, and then he became Paul. Paul, this great man who we now uh, associate with uh, the mission to the Gentiles. We even know uh, that he was one of Kanye West's inspiration for compiling the life of Pablo, so that's important. But what's so important about this specific story? You know, we hear about Paul's great feats in the New Testament. He wrote a large bulk of our New Testament, um, a prominent apostle. But we often forget that his ministry began blind. The same man who, who said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, began his ministry blind. So today I wanna to talk to you about the power of community and how community can help us to check our blind spots in our lives. So tell the person next to you, check your blind spot. I told you I'm Pentecostal, okay? <laughs> so Acts 9 teaches us that when God was getting ready to use Paul to, to, to have this great ministry, God sent a person to do it. God never wanted someone as anointed as Paul to ever forget that he needed people. And God would never give authority to someone who thought that they didn't need anybody. 
So Paul's first lesson in his ministry was a lesson in being blind. It's almost as if God said, Paul, I'm going to groom you in this blind spot first, and then you can go out and do all the great things, uh, in fact, also to suffer for my name. So if we try to lead beyond the knowledge that we're capable of being blinded, then we're really not trustworthy to lead. What I mean is this, if you think you're able to go the road alone, scripture says, be careful that you do not fall. There's an African proverb that I love that states, if you wanna go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, go together. See, I used to want to go fast, very fast. But I quickly learned that sometimes farther is better than faster. So what makes a trustworthy leader or person is not necessarily how well you can master a skill or a major or a career, but it's our humility, our sobriety, our awareness in knowing that maybe we don't know it all. Socrates said it best, all I know is I know nothing. And no, that's not a mantra for finals week. Um, so, so what is a blind spot? Metaphorically, we all have them. They're the angles in our lives that we don't consider or see because we don't know that they're there. But when you're open to relationships, God will supply you with the people in your life who will check your blind spot. So now tell the person next to you, check my blind spot. <laughs> what we find in scripture is that whenever God's about to broaden a vision, whenever God's about to use a, a man or a woman to the fullest extent, God usually does so by broadening horizontally, by connecting other people uh, for a broader perspective. And many of you may experience this in college, right? We grow up a certain way, we have a certain value system and way of life, we come to college, and suddenly we're exposed to hundreds of people who think differently than us. Was I the only one who experienced kind of a, a shock when I, when I realized that the world isn't just my perspective? So everyone has this blind spot. I really love the story of Paul and Ananias because Ananias kind of just plays that one role but he's obedient and he's faithful in that role, which launches Paul into his ministry. We also see this in the Old Testament, in 2 Kings, in the story of Elisha and his servant Gehazi. So they're at war, and Elisha and Gehazi are, are looking at the opposing army, and Gehazi is afraid, because he sees the opposing army, and he tells Elisha, they're more than us. I mean, they're, they're gonna destroy us. But Elisha prays for Gehazi, and look what he says. He says, Father, open his eyes. In that moment, Gehazi's eyes were opened, and he began to see the hills full of horses and chariots. And Elisha says, there are more with us than the, they who are against us. So help was already there, but maybe our eyes just need to be opened to the help that is already there to the relationships that are already there. So perhaps then our prayer should be, God, open my eyes to see the potential for friendships or relationships that are already here. Paul talks about the body in 1 Corinthians 12. He says, we're all members of this one unified body. But notice Paul doesn't say pursue unity. He says, be united, as in we're already united, we just need to act like it. So how do we navigate these types of relationships? Do we have anyone to check our blind spots? See, Paul was quickly taught that before he could become this powerful apostle to the Gentiles, he needed a humble man named Ananias, a faithful and obedient man, to pray for him, to call him Brother Saul, when just a day before he was on his way to murder Christians. He needed that to unleash him into his destiny. So perhaps before you step into your calling, your career, your major, or wherever God is leading you to, maybe it's a friendship or a relationship, in those moments, those friendships and relationships will help uncover some things for you. Things within you, things around you. I don't know if this has been your experience that when you connect with people, Hopefully, they bring out the best in you, if it's a healthy friendship, right? 
They bring out the best in you, and you start to see things about yourself that maybe you've never seen before. Maybe that's Biola for you. Most times we find that when God wants to heal an area of your life, he'll use a person to do it. If God wants to Uh, wants you to look at your life differently or yourself differently, he'll often use a person to do that. Or if God wants you to get serious about your future calling and and ministry or, or career or whatever it may be, he'll use a relationship. Maybe it's our roommates, our friends that we make here. But if there's one thing that we're sure of about relationships is that they're hard, right? They take work sometimes. They they involve heart-to-heart discussions sometimes, conflict, but that's okay. Because our greatest resource in life is not money, not even happiness. Our greatest resource are other humans. Humans are what God gives us, supplies us with, so that in this struggle of life, our perspectives are protected. Because perspective is everything. Something's either a problem or it's an opportunity. Right? So those around us will check our perspectives. But let me tell you, society doesn't want us having healthy, vibrant, future-minded relationships. It wants dead and unhealthy, toxic relationships that never challenge us or make us grow or are life-giving. So our community, our network is everything. When I was growing up, I tended to be somewhat of a, a lone ranger. I always have been, uh, even though I was always surrounded by family, um, as you haven't, if you've noticed already, I'm Latina, so that means I have a huge family, um, but there were times where I still found myself on a different wavelength or a different frequency than them. I could be surrounded by people but still feel like I'm on a different wavelength. I'm the oldest child in my family. Any other eldest child here? I get you. Uh, You know what it's like. The responsibility falls on you. You know, the strictest discipline falls on you. Maybe you were used to taking care of everyone else. And truthfully, we're our parents' guinea pigs, right? I mean, your parents are literally learning how to be parents with you. So I often had my own thing going on whenever, I would go to church when I was around eight or nine. I loved to read. So after church service was over, I would take my little chapter book and go into the car and read while I would wait for my parents to say their farewell tour to the whole church. Hashtag pastor's kid life. Um, When I was 13 in middle school, I actually preferred to eat lunch alone uh, or with a cousin of mine rather than a larger group of friends. And I wasn't actually scared of being called a loner. In fact, I was like, yes, I am a loner. I love being alone. Um, But when I was 17, I became very independent, extremely. So when I decided to go to Bible school, that was a disaster for me. Why? Because suddenly I had to share a room with other women. Uh, Now, I had shared room, you know, a room my whole life. I have um, three sisters. But this type of roommate experience was new to me. Um, you know, this is the, the experience of someone taking your cup of noodles, you know, at night, and that was your last one, and just this new experience of why is this person in my things, and um, the Lord really broke me through that experience, learned a lot. And then when I was 22, and I moved away from home for the first time to go to North Carolina for my master's degree, that changed everything. I would spend Friday nights walking around in the Walmart, because that's all there was to do, um, and I enjoyed it. But there came a point where I had to realize that even though I enjoyed being alone, I'm very introverted on the Myers-Briggs, I'm like 90% I, so yeah. Um, Even though I loved being alone, I hated feeling lonely. There was this deep longing in me to know people and to be known by them. This is the great human need. Can anyone else relate to this? You see, there's one thing that we need to remember. Isolation is not the same thing as independence. You see, Christianity was never meant to be lived alone, but always with other people in mind. Sometimes that's the last thing we want. But this is what it means to live in community. 
in the last couple of hours in Jesus' life, and you know, we just celebrated Easter, we read in the Gospels that in his final hours, Jesus was eating with his 12 disciples. He was sitting around a table with a group of men who had no idea the suffering he was about to endure. They had no idea the agony that awaited him in just a few hours. So I asked myself, Jesus, why would you want them around you? They don't understand what's about to happen. Sometimes the excuse that I would use when I isolated myself was, they just don't understand me. But if the most important figure in human history, Jesus Christ, the man who literally split history in two, was sitting and eating with his disciples before being crucified, then clearly community is important. They were about to deny Jesus. They were about to run away, scared and anxious. I asked myself, why would he want friends like that? Why wouldn't he just spend his last couple of moments alone, praying with the Father in the garden? Or why why didn't he just go about his ministry healing and doing miracles on his own? He easily could have done that, he's a son of God, but he chose to invest his life for three years with a group of men who still didn't get it in his final hours. Only to show us the significance of relationships and community. These men saw everything. They saw people rising from the dead. They saw children being healed. Jesus could have fed the 5,000 on his own, but he used other people to do it. So Jesus checked the blind spots of his disciples. Jesus calls into account so many times their lack of faith, their hypocrisy even, and their inability to recognize what he had come to earth for. See, part of learning to live in community is also learning how to be a friend. My mom always told me, if you wanna have friends, you gotta be a friend. But being a friend is different than being an enabler. Right? It took me a while to realize this. Sometimes we don't want a friend, we just want to help. To be clear, friends do help each other, but our friendships shouldn't be based on our need to be needed. This is what they call a messiah complex. It's not a iron sharpens iron relationship like Proverbs wants us to have, but it's more of, you know, I feel good that this person needs me. Now on the other hand, if we can only befriend the people who are nice to us, then maybe the issue there is more pride. We need to reach. Sometimes it's okay to say that we need help and that we need people. It's okay to say, I admire you. I've heard it said that jealousy is simply frustrated admiration. So why don't we approach the person and be their student? Scripture tells us in Luke 6, what credit is it to you if you love those who love you, if you do good to those who do good to you, but love your enemies and do good to them? This is a tall order, right? So perhaps we can revisit that quote. I've seen it all over Instagram. It says, don't cross oceans for people who wouldn't cross a puddle for you. But sometimes friendship will require you to cross those oceans. That's gospel love. Back in the early 90s, there was a British anthropologist named Dr. Robin Dunbar, and they came to an interesting conclusion that humans could only maintain social relationships with an average of 148 individuals. Now, that's a lot, right? But due to the size of our brain's uh, neocortex, uh, it was discovered, you know, Dunbar's number 148 to 150 people. So basically, more relationship requires more social information processing, which demands more cognitive resources, etc. And we only have so much brain power. So basically, we top out at having about 150 meaningful relationships in our lives. I remember at my wedding, I think I had about 300 people. Ask me if I knew all those people. I didn't. We top out at 150 meaningful relationships, and we all have them. Sometimes, though, they're on social media, uh, a good chunk of them maybe are on Facebook, 
But out of those 148, Dunbar said, we really only maintain about five intimate relationships at once. That sounds more uh, reasonable, right? It's typically a question of how much time and energy can we invest in others. And quality matters more than quantity. So, we need each other. We need to lean on each other. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12 about the body, when one member suffers, we all suffer. When one member is glorified, we are all glorified, or we all rejoice. So what would it look like? Think for a second, imagine, what would it look like to be part of a community that uplifts each other, that celebrates our strengths and our talents? And not only that, but a community that also suffers together. I noticed the t-shirts that many are wearing about Sexual Assault Awareness Month, suffering together in solidarity for others, to make their pain our pain, their burden our burden, to be united in one love and one heart. That's what community is. And that's what college could be as well. Students on a mission to make an impact in your own little piece of the world. but it's not just our own mission in the world. We must take others with us. We must allow others to check these blind spots and to teach and to shape our perspectives. Because just like Paul, it might liberate us. So remaining connected through friendships, relationships, and community, this will train us in the lessons of life that we'll take throughout our whole lives. It trains us to see the image of God in every single person that we meet. So let's tap into community today. Let's ask God to open our eyes, to heal our blindness, and to allow us to see what may already be in front of us. Imagine the potential of the friendships you could make here if we would only reach. Because let me tell you, life can be lonely, but we don't have to do it alone. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.